Okay, so for this video lesson, uh, we're doing topic 15.4 uh, and 15.5. We're going to combine them into one topic um, just because 15.5 is a little bit shorter. Okay, so uh, we're going to start with 15.4. This is the Bohr model of the atom. So um, Bohr, uh, his model features orbitals or electrons orbiting at particular energy levels. Um, this could also be referred to as uh, the solar system model, okay? Um, now, I do want to make a note here. So this was in 1913. Okay, so this was after um, Rutherford's model of the atom, okay? Um, and Rutherford helped a little bit on this too. Okay, so Niels Bohr, he had an issue with Rutherford's model of the atom in that he believed that, um, or he disputed the fact that orbiting electrons necessarily lose energy, right? As the electron is orbiting a nucleus, the direction is constantly changing, so we consider these orbiting electrons to be accelerating. Okay, and we know uh, back from unit C that if charges are accelerating, uh, they should produce some sort of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so Bohr applied Planck's concept of the quantized energy. So remember, um, this is a quanta. So energy comes in discrete packets as quanta. Okay, and he applied the idea of quanta to the model of the atom. Okay, so enter Hans Hansen. So this... Uh, I had actually a pretty difficult time trying to find a photo of Hans Hansen, so I did a little bit of digging, and I think this is Hans Hansen, okay? He looks like a mean muggin. Um, but he was a former classmate of Bohr's and an expert in spectroscopy, okay? We'll talk about that um, on the next slide. Um, but Hans Hansen noticed a mathematical pattern in the wavelength of light uh, either emitted or absorbed by hydrogen. Okay, so uh, when he and Bohr were talking to one another about this, um, this allowed Bohr to make the connection between quanta and the energy associated with orbiting electrons, such that they can only orbit at particular energy levels. Okay, so that is Hans Hansen, and he helped out Bohr uh, make that connection between quanta and orbiting electrons. Okay, so uh, what is spectroscopy? So spectroscopy is the study of light emitted or absorbed by different materials, okay? So uh, we have a continuous spectrum, so this just goes uh, from violet to red, okay? Um, now, a bright line spectra, uh, this is also known as the emission spectra. Okay, um, and the emission spectra or the bright line spectra is going to be unique to each element. Okay, so we'll notice uh, hydrogen has uh, bright lines produced at different areas than sodium, uh, and sodium has different um, bands or different bright line spectra than neon, etc. Okay, so that is emission spectra. And the one at the bottom here is the absorption spectrum, okay? So we have um, either an emission or an absorption spectrum, and again, they're going to be unique for each element. Um, spectroscopy can be used to actually study um, the composition of stars in the, uh, well, outside of our solar system, right? Um, based on the emission spectra of these stars, we can tell um, what is the... Uh, components, or what is the fuel, what makes up these stars emitting that light. Okay, so we have a continuous spectrum, right? Um, so this is where we have high density and hot matter, okay? This is passing through a diffraction grating, and we don't notice um, any 
absorption or emission, okay? This is just a continuous spectrum. There are no bands or dark spots. Okay, that is a continuous spectrum. Um, now, we, we touched on emission and absorption spectrum in the last topic. Um, so when you have a hot gas um, going through a uh, diffraction grating, um, so when we have a hot gas at a low pressure going through a diffraction grating, uh, this is going to produce a pattern of bright lines. Okay, so in this one we see uh, red, we see red and orange and green and blue. Okay, and next we have the uh, absorption line spectrum. So this is a pattern of dark lines. And this is produced when light passes through a gas at low pressure. Okay, so make sure we know the difference between emission and absorption spectrum. So Bohr's model is based on the study of emission and absorption spectra. Um, and these are characteristic frequencies or wavelengths of light which are emitted or absorbed by a particular element. Okay, so if we look at the spectral lines from a uh, star far, far away, and we noticed um, that it had spectral lines kind of similar to that of hydrogen here, okay, then we uh, could know that uh, hydrogen is present within that star system, okay? So this is the absorption and emission spectrum for hydrogen. So at these particular wavelengths, uh, light is going to be absorbed, okay? And then when it's emission spectrum, it is going to emit wavelengths at those particular wavelengths, okay? So at those particular wavelengths, the emitted light will have uh, an energy associated with them, okay? So make sure we know the difference between emission and absorption line spectrum and what we can do with spectroscopy. Okay, so there are three basic principles to Bohr's model of the atom. So number one, electrons in an atom orbit the nucleus, but they can only do so at specific distances from the nucleus. Okay, so the radius of a particular orbit is dependent on the square of the orbit number. Okay, so orbit number is going to be our n here. Okay, so our n, so that can be the radius at that particular orbital number. Okay, r1 is going to be the base orbital, uh, the base orbital radius for the hydrogen atom which is 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11 meters. Uh, I would encourage you guys to write this on your formula sheet. Okay, um, and yeah, n is the orbital number, r is the radius, okay? Rn will be the radius at that particular orbital number. Okay, uh, the second principle of the Bohr model is that orbiting electrons have both kinetic and potential energy. But this energy is not radiated as an electron moves in its orbit, okay? It kind of keeps that energy as it's orbiting within the nucleus. Um, the energy levels, so like the N from last question, are sometimes referred to as stationary states, okay? So when we're at N1, this is our ground level. And if we excite it up to N6, it would be excited up here. Now, for that electron to be excited from N1 to N6, it is going to require energy, of course. Okay? And the other way around, if it is going from N6 to N1, it is going to release energy and it will going it is going to release light 
Okay? So the amount of energy an electron has in respect to the nucleus is zero once it's ionized, right? Once you um, apply enough energy to get rid of that electron, it no longer belongs to that nucleus. So it will have uh, zero energy with respect to the nucleus. Okay, so because of this, um, orbiting electrons are given negative energy values. Okay, because when those electrons uh, require sufficient energy, they will release energy, right? Um, or if we're going from like N3 to N6 here, we're going to require energy, uh, a negative energy there. Okay, so the last uh, formula that we looked at on the last slide, this is related to the, um, the distance of the electron. Uh, in this formula here, we are finding the energy associated with the energy um, level, or with what orbital number we are at, right? So we have En, so that will be the energy associated with the nth energy level. E1 is the base energy for the hydrogen atom, so for N1, for the hydrogen atom, or E1, is negative 13.6 electron volts, or negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay, and again, N is going to be our orbital number there. All right. So that last equation that we looked at was derived from the formula here. So the energy associated with that orbital number is equal to negative RH multiplied by HC divided by N squared. So H, of course, is Planck's constant. RH is the Rydberg constant. So RH is equal to 1.097 times 10 to the 7, 10 to the exponent 7, meter minus 1, or per meter, right? Okay, so again, uh, you should write that on your formula sheet. It's not on there, uh, unless I missed it. Okay, so we know our, our H, we know H, we know C. So as long as we know the orbital number, we can find the energy associated with that uh, orbital number, okay? So using this formula here, what is the energy of the third allowed orbit in the hydrogen atom, okay? So we know that N is equal to three, okay? And really that's all we need because R, H, H, and C are all constants. So let's go ahead and punch this into a formula. So energy associated with the third energy level is equal to negative uh, my RH value, which is 1.097 times 10 to the negative 7 meters minus 1, multiplied by H, which is 6.63 times 10 to the negative, th uh, negative 34, multiplied by C, all divi divided by my orbit number squared. So three squared. Okay, punch these into your calculator and we will find that the energy associated with the third orbital number is equal to negative 2.42 times 10, the negative 19 joules. Okay, for H I use the uh, joule seconds one not the electron volt seconds. Um, okay, for some of these questions, um, you guys are going to be given the n value only in the question. So if the n is just equal to three, like we see here, um, for your sig digs, uh, use your constants, okay? So if we have 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules, um, we should have three sig digs in our answer. All right. Um, and we're not going to use this formula too, too much, but I just wanted to uh, show you how we could use this. Okay. 
So let's get into some Bohr model examples, okay? So <clears throat> how much energy does it take to move the electron in a hydrogen atom from the ground state? So ground state, N equals 1, and we're going to the N equals 4 energy level, okay? So N equals 1 to N equals 4. This is our initial, and that is our final, right? So if we wanted to find how much energy it takes to go from one orbital or one energy level to another, we need to use the formula that we saw on the last page, okay? So we want to use En is equal to E1 divided by N here. Okay? And we are looked, we're looking for the change in energy going from E1 to E4. So any time that we're trying to calculate the change in something, we can do E final minus E initial. Okay, so our final is 4 and our initial is 1. So my delta E from 1 to 4 is equal to the energy level at 4 minus the energy at orbital level 1. Okay, so E4, uh, we're going to use, so our formula... En is equal to E1 over N. So my E1 is negative 2.18. Okay, so E1 to 4 is equal to E4 minus E1. And then my energy level, or my energy associated with orbital 4 is E1 divided by N squared. Okay, so at my E4, we have negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules divided by 4 squared minus negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules divided by 1 squared. Okay, so we punch these into your calculator. So change in energy going from n equals 1 to n equals 4 is equal to 2.04 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay, and we are exciting, we're giving this electron energy, right? So it requires energy, so it would be a positive value. Um, if it was going from 4 to 1, it would be releasing energy. Um, so it would be, well, if it's releasing energy, um, it's a little bit different than requiring energy. Okay, So just make sure uh, we are reading the question, knowing if we're going from 1 to 4 or 4 to 1. Okay, so same kind of thing. Uh, how much energy, uh, but this is the opposite, right? We're going from n equals 5 to n equals 2. So our initial is N5, and our final is N2. So delta E is equal to E final, which is E2, minus initial, which is E to the 5. Okay, delta E, so my, at my N equals 2, I have negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules divided by 2 squared minus my initial negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules divided by my initial which is 5 squared. Okay, punch these into your calculator. We get a change in energy equal to negative 4.58 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. OK, 
Okay, so this is negative value. So this is saying that it requires 4.58 times 10 to the negative 19 joules to excite, or sorry, it, when we're going from n equals 5 to n equals 2, 4.58 times 10 to the negative 19 joules of energy is going to be released. Okay, so we're talking about the three different principles of the Bohr model. So number three, for an electron to be ionized, or for an electron to go from N1 to N2, uh, energy must be absorbed. Okay, conversely to that, if an electron is going from N equals 2 to N equals 1, it is going to release energy. Okay, um, releasing energy can occur spontaneously if there's an excited electron, um, but to excite an electron, we, we do need to uh, require energy. Okay, so just a refresher. Um, the bundles of energy that are either emitted or absorbed are the quantas of light, which were described earlier by Max Planck. Um, and this also explains why only fre uh, certain frequencies or wavelengths of light are either absorbed or emitted by particular elements, okay? Because they have um, those particular energy levels, right? N equals one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and then as those are either absorbing energy, it's going to leave an, a, an absorption spectra, or if it is emitting energy, it will leave an emission spectra. Okay, so enter um, the Rydberg and Ritz equation. Okay, so Johann Balmer started out and he developed an equation um, which was kind of limited because it only allowed or it only described the wavelengths of light emitted or absorbed going from like an N6 to an N2 orbital level. Or like N4 to N2, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, that's gonna be the Balmer series. Okay, so a Balmer series came out, it only involved um, energy emissions going to the second uh, energy level. Um, but then Rydberg and Ritz come along and they do a little bit of mathematical magic on the Balmer series and they are able to calculate using this formula um, the energy transformations which are undergone, uh, which are taking place by electrons either going from, you know, maybe N1 to N3 or from N6 to N4. Okay, the Balmer series, we were limited to emissions related to the second energy level, uh, but using the Rydberg-Ritz equation, uh, we can calculate these transitions by any atom, okay, by any element. Okay, so this is uh, really convenient for us. So, so yeah, this equation will describe the spectral lines of all atoms. Again, N is going to be our energy levels, right? So final minus initial, those are going to be our energy levels. Uh, those are going to be squared. And this R here, uh, RH, that's going to be Rydberg's constant. Okay, so this equation necessitates knowledge of the wavelength of the light emitted when it's warm or absorbed when it's cool. And a constant using, or called Rydberg's constant.
Okay, we talked about that uh, on the last slide. Okay, so I briefly mentioned the Balmer series on the uh, last slide. Um, and this is describing the emission and absorption of spectra of visible light that will result where transitions occur to or from the second energy level in the hydrogen atom. Okay? Uh, each transition is associated with a specific color or wavelength of light. Okay, so if we start with violet here, if we're going from energy level 6 and we're going to energy level 2, um, this is moving down four energy levels, right? So we're going from 6 to 2. So that is uh, quite, well, it's a large distance, especially if you can just consider uh, between 3 and 2, right? So there's a large energy difference there. It's going to emit uh, energy, which has a small wavelength, but high energy, right? So going from 6 to 2, because it is dropping so many energy levels, uh, the, en the photon emitted will be more energetic than, for example, something going from like 3 to 2, right? Because there's only one energy level it is releasing energy from. So when it goes from 3 to 2, it emits red light, which we know has a long wavelength. And when compared to blue or violet, it is uh, much less energetic. Okay, um, this Balmer series, there is a question uh, on your practice problems related to this. Okay, so um, make sure we understand that the Balmer series just involves transitions to or from the second energy level. And if we jump back to uh, the Rydberg Ritz, this equation um, can calculate the transition from any orbital, okay? It can go from like six to four or from one to three. We're not just limited to the two, uh, such as we are in the Balmer series. Okay? So other series were later uh, discovered corresponding to transitions to and from other energy levels. So the Lyman series um, is kind of focuses on UV light. Uh, the Passion series will focus on infrared light. Um, and yeah, so we have a few different series. Um, we're really only going to focus on the Balmer series. And we're also going to use that Rydberg Ritz equation. Okay, so you can kind of forget about the other ones. Um, within chapter 15 video links, uh, there's one on applications of spectroscopy. Um, so I want you guys to watch that video and to also read the article where you found that video. Okay, it's a really, it's a good read. Okay, so if, so using, um, those last couple formulas, either the Balmer series or the Rydberg Ritz equation. Um, so if we know the transition that an electron has undergone, we can calculate the wavelength of EMR that will be emitted, okay? So if we know the energy change between orbital levels, <clears throat> we can calculate the frequency or wavelength using E is equal to uh, Planck's constant times the frequency, or C is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Okay, so if we know the wavelength of emitted light to be 632.8 times 10 to the negative nine uh, meters, I'm assuming that would be, uh, we can calculate the energy using these two formulas right here, okay? We're gonna do a little bit of that today, and you guys are also gonna be doing that in your assignment for this topic. All right, so let's use the rydberg ritz equation here. We'll get a couple of examples of practice here. So we're asked to find the wavelength of the light emitted by a hydrogen atom when it drops from N5 to N2, okay? So it goes N5 to N2. So this is going to be my initial, and that's going to be my final. Okay, the rydberg ritz equation 1 over wavelength is equal to the uh, Rydberg constant multiplied 
by 1 over uh, n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. Okay? So our final is 2 and our initial is 1. So let's go ahead and punch these into our calculator. So 1 over wavelength is equal to RH. That's a constant. Okay? Uh, and then our n final is 2, so 1 over 2 squared, minus 1 over initial, 1 over 5 squared. Okay, so if you put this calculation into your calculator, classic, uh, 1 over wavelength is going to be 231, or 2,310,000. Uh, per meter, meter minus one. Okay, now we need to solve for wavelength. So basically we're taking the inverse of one divided by 2,310,000 uh, per meter. So if we solve for wavelength here, we get an answer of 4.33 times 10 to the negative seven meters. And let's put this into nanometers, just to allow us to recognize, or just, yeah. I like putting it in nanometers because it allows me to realize what it is, what are we looking at, okay? So we're gonna multiply that by 10 to the nine nanometers for one meter, and we'll get a wavelength uh, of 433 nanometers. All right, so that is the Rydberg-Ritz equation. Okay, example two. Uh, find the wavelength of light that a hydrogen atom will absorb when its electron moves from N3 to N7. Okay, so my initial is three, my final is seven. So again, we can use our Rydberg-Ritz formula here. So 1 over wavelength is equal to RH multiplied by 1 divided by uh, N final squared. So 1 divided by 7 squared minus 1 over N initial squared, which is 3 squared. Okay, so punch this into your calculator. 1 over wavelength is equal to negative... Uh, 997,732 per meter. Okay, we need to take the inverse of that. We need to solve for our wavelength. Okay, so multiply both sides by wavelength, divide by 997,000. Okay, you will get a wavelength equal to 1.00 times 10 to the negative 6 meters. And if we convert this to nanometers, multiply by 10 to the 9, uh, we will get a wavelength of 1.00 times 10 to the 3 nanometers. Okay? Uh, 1,000 1, nanometers if we are rounding to 3 sig digs. Okay? Great. So that is our Rydberg Ritz. Um, now, for our energy levels, um, typically we will see them um, in a diagram such as this. Okay, this is an energy level diagram. And basically is what we're saying um, that as we get further and further away from the ground state, um, eventually the energy between those uh, energy levels will come down to zero, right? As we get further and further away, uh, the gap gets smaller and smaller, right? So as we get higher and higher, eventually that um, the energy is going to approach zero, right? As we get further and further away, right? Essentially, 
um, the more energy we apply to it, right, the further that electron is going to be away from the nucleus, and eventually it is going to be ionized, right? Eventually that electron will be booted out of the orbit of that nucleus, and then it has no energy with respect to the nucleus. Okay, um, now this is, uh, the one on the left is a hydrogen, and the one on the right here is for mercury, okay? So again, uh, different elements are going to have different energy level diagrams, okay? Uh, what you guys need to be able to do is to interpret one, and for example, you might see a question being like, um, an electron emits a wavelength going from N5 to N4. Okay, so if we know N5 is up here and N4 is right there, that middle ground right there, the change in energy would be 0 0.54 electron volts released if we're going from N5 to N4. Uh, if we're going from N2 to N3, okay, uh, N3 value is 1.51, so 3.4 minus 1.51 will tell you the energy required to excite an electron from N equals 2 to N equals 3, okay? I realized um, I made a mistake for N5 to N4, so if N2 and three and four and five. So if we're going from, this is one, two, three. So this is actually gonna be my four. Okay, so N four and this is N three. So if we're going from three to four, we're going to need um, 0 0.85 minus 0 0.54. So we're going to need 0 0.31 electron volts of energy to excite that electron from three to four, okay? So if you need to find the energy required going from one energy level to another, and you are given an energy level diagram, you just need to uh, calculate the difference between those two energy levels. Okay, so this is just kind of summary of what we've talked about so far. So the electron travels in uh, circular orbits around the nucleus. The orbits have quantized sizes and energies. Energy is emitted when the, uh, when the atom, sorry, energy is emitted from the atom when the electron jumps from one orbit to another. Um, so, okay, uh, the Balmer series transition in which an electron jumps from N3 to N2. So if we're going, if our electron is excited, it's in the N equals three orbital. As it emits energy, or yeah, as it kind of de-excites from our third energy level to the second energy level, it is going to emit a wavelength. And that is going to be a red wavelength. Okay, so when we have an electron in a hydrogen atom going from n equals three to n equals two, it is red. Okay, we all know this from the Balmer series. And again, you can just jump back up here um, for something like that. So if you're going from n equals six to n equals two, it's going to emit violet light because violet light is more energetic than red light, right? There's more of a delta n going from six to two, then from three to two. Okay, so although uh, the Bohr model was really good in understanding that particular electrons would have particular wavelengths and energies going from one uh, orbital, like one end to the other, um, but there were some shortfallings. Um, let's give them a break. Well, this was the early 1900s, right? 
Um, so three things that were really wrong with it. So one, it is not accurate for atoms that have two or more electrons. So anything but hydrogen, right? Hydrogen is essentially uh, just a proton and an electron, right? Um, it does not explain why orbiting electrons do not radiate energy. Remember, um, accelerating charges should produce EMR. Okay, electrons do not produce EMR as they're orbiting. Um, and it also does not expect the Zeeman effect. Uh, and this is just an observation where the presence of a magnetic field will split spectral lines into multiple closely spaced lines. Okay, so there were some limitations to the Bohr model. Okay, um, yeah, so anyways, we've talked about de Broglie or de Broglie before, right? Um, and remember de Broglie had the wave particle duality, right? Um, and de Broglie suggested that because electrons move in waves, that electrons which orbit the nucleus uh, must orbit in a wave-like pattern. Okay, these must be standing waves having a whole number of wavelengths. So your wavelengths or your energy levels can only be like n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Because if you had an n equals like 3.3, you wouldn't be able to have um, like a perfect amount of wavelengths in that orbital, and you would have destructive interference uh, within those electrons. Okay, so because 2 pi r equals circumference of a circle, um, de Broglie and Bohr kind of applied this um, to the orbit of an electron around a nucleus, where 2 pi rn, where rn is going to be the radius at that particular, particular orbital level, is equal to n times the wavelength. Okay? So this formula here, we call this one the De Broglie wavelength formula. Okay, that is the De Broglie wavelength. Okay, um, and that wavelength will be the electron wavelength at that orbital. Okay, and Rn is going to be the radius at n orbital. Okay, so that's kind of it for 15.4, uh, and I'm just going to motor on with 15.5 because this is kind of a short topic here. Okay, so we're almost done. Thanks for hanging in there so far. Okay, so from that last uh, formula that we looked at, so 2 pi rn is equal to n times the wavelength, because we know that the wavelength uh, of de Broglie is equal to Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity. Uh, de Broglie was able to derive this formula here. 2 pi rn is equal to n times Planck's constant divided by mass times velocity. And this is the quantum condition. Okay, the quantum, uh, quantum condition will dictate uh, the radius at which orbits can, or electrons can orbit a nucleus. Okay, and as I just mentioned, um, because 2 pi r is equal to the circumference of an orbit, um, we have, uh, this is de Broglie's wavelength formula, okay? And again, um, only certain energies and radii can exist here.
Okay, so we have three examples, and then we are uh, finished for chapter 15. Okay, so this one here. Find the De Broglie wavelength for an electron in the ground state of a hydrogen atom. Okay, so electron is in the N1 for hydrogen. Okay, um, and we also know we are in the first orbital and we're asked to find what is the wavelength. Okay, so we want to use a De Broglie wavelength formula here. So 2 pi Rn is equal to n time lambda. Okay, we are asked to find the De Broglie wavelength. So let's isolate for wavelength. We get 2 pi Rn divided by n. Okay, we our n is equal to 1, so we know our uh, radius at the first orbital. Okay, uh, this is something you should include on your formula sheet. Okay, write that down, uh, just keep that handy later. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and find our wavelength then. So wavelength is equal to 2 pi Rn, the radius, or R1, right, the radius at the first orbital level, is 5.29 times 10 to the negative 11 meters, and all divided by 1, because our n is equal to 1. Okay, so punch this into your calculator, we will get a wavelength of 3.32 times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Okay, so that was the De Broglie wavelength. Okay, so next one. Um, this ties into part A. Uh, we need to find the momentum, speed, and kinetic energy of the electron in uh, part A. So this is our rounded number, okay? Um, but as you're solving B and, or, well, the next three parts of this question, uh, make sure you do not round your intermediates, okay? Okay, so we're asked for momentum. We're asked for speed. And we're asked for kinetic energy. So hopefully you're saying, well, we did a lot of kinetic energy and velocity in physics 20, so we're pros now. I'll be like, okay, great. <laughs> okay, anyways, so from last question, we know that the wavelength, and this is not this is not a rounded value. Well, this is rounded, but I did not round it for my calculations. So wavelength is 3.32. Sound very good one. 3.32. Times 10 to the negative 10 meters. Again, not rounded. So I don't want to write down a bunch of digits. And we're asked to find the momentum. So, look on our formula sheets. Think of De Broglie. What is the momentum of a wave? Well, momentum is equal to Planck's constant divided by our wavelength. Okay? So, Planck's constant divided by 3.32 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, gives me a momentum of 1.99 times 10 to the negative 24 kilogram meter per second. That is our momentum. Now, hopefully for momentum and velocity, hopefully you're reflecting back to unit A, and you're saying, Mr. Jones, if we know the momentum, we can find the velocity. Because we know the mass of an electron. Right? So divide both sides by m. Velocity is equal to momentum. Okay, so again, don't round your intermediates here. So momentum is 1.99 times 10 to the negative 24 
kilogram meter per second, divided by the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. Okay, well that gives us a velocity of 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Okay, and our last one, kinetic energy. If we know our velocity and we know our mass, we can calculate our kinetic energy. Right? Kinetic energy is 1 over 2 mv squared. 1 over 2 times our mass. Multiplied by our velocity, which is not rounded. Well, my value is rounded, but when I calculated it, it was not. 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second squared. Okay, punch those into your calculator. So you get kinetic energy equal to 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Okay, that is a really cool question. I like how it ties in physics 20. Unit A, unit C, okay? So make sure you're able uh, to make the connection between uh, these, uh, these variables. Okay, now this last question, uh, we are going to generally express the de Broglie wavelength of the n equals three energy levels for any atom. Okay, so we're going to do a little bit of calculus and some woo-woo formula stuff here. Um, so, so hang on, okay? So we're asked for the wavelength at the third energy level, okay? And we know N is equal to 3. Okay, so de Broglie's wavelength, 2 pi Rn is equal to n times lambda of n, right? n is just going to be at what energy level we are at. Okay, we're also going to tie in Bohr's equation. For atomic radii. Okay, and remember that is Rn is equal to R1 times n squared. Okay, we, we talked about that early, uh, earlier in this lesson. Okay, so hopefully you're recognizing, well, I have an Rn here, and I have an Rn here, so let's go ahead and substitute that in there, okay? So 2 pi Rn becomes 2 pi R1 times n squared is equal to n times lambda of n. Okay, we can get rid of this n and that exponent. And then we're going to be left with, I'm just going to flip this, so uh, wavelength of n is equal to 2 pi r1 times n. Okay, I am going to simplify this by factoring out an n because we know that the wavelength of 1 is equal to n r1 times 2 pi. Okay? So where are we at? So let's factor out our n here. So wavelength of n is equal to n multiplied by 2 pi r1. So 2 pi r1. So if we 2 pi r1 is equal to n times lambda of 1, right? If our n equals 1, then we're just going to have um, uh, wavelength 1 is equal to n r1 
times 2 pi. Okay, so if we have, um, at this point here, if we have 2 pi r1, if we are at uh, n equals 1 and our wavelength of 1, then we're going to have, we can rewrite this here as 2 pi r1 n is equal to wavelength 1, right? If our n is equal to 1, this will, uh, I guess we could essentially get rid of that, right? So we know that our wavelength 1 is equal to 2 pi times r1. Okay? So if we have 2 pi r1 right here, and we also know that wavelength 1 is equal to 2 pi r1, so we can go ahead and substitute that in to where we see uh, 2 pi r1, okay? So wavelength at general orbital n is equal to n times our 2 pi r1, which is also equal to wavelength 1. Okay, so this is uh, a general formula for any of the de Broglie wavelengths for the energy levels. So the wavelength of, at energy level n is equal to the energy level multiplied by the wavelength at energy level 1. Okay, so if we know that, then, so wavelength of, of 1 is going to be 1 times the wavelength of 1, which, which makes sense. Wavelength of 2 is going to equal 2 times the wavelength of 1. And then for wavelength 3, which is what we're looking for, is going to be 3 multiplied by the wavelength at the first energy level. Okay? So the de Broglie wavelength at the n equals 3 energy level will be 3 multiplied by the wavelength at the first energy level. Okay, so we've talked about the quantum mechanical model. Okay, uh, quantum mechanical model. Um, this is essentially a model based on probability and the lengths at which we will find an electron in a particular orbital level. Okay, uh, quantum mechanical model is based on the works of Planck uh, and Einstein. Okay, a few big names. Um, it is also influenced by uh, Compton, remember Compton scattering, uh, Niels Bohr was a key influencer in the development of the quantum mechanical model, uh, de Broglie and a scientist named Max Born, okay, we didn't talk too much about Max Born, but he was also important, uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger, okay, Heisenberg uh, was a scientist who worked on the development of the nuclear bomb, uh, the Manhattan Project. Okay, uh, Schrodinger, uh, he is actually probably best well known for his uh, Schrodinger's cat experiment, right? Uh, in the States, if you have a cat in a box, before you measure, you have um, no idea if it is either dead or alive until you look. Okay, um, that was kind of taking uh, a stab at the measurement problem um, and the observing issue. Okay, so we had a few important scientists that contributed to the quantum uh, mechanical model. And again, this is uh, pretty much the model that we uh, use today. Well, it still holds up from about 100 years ago. Okay, so the quantum mechanical model is still the most widely accepted theory of the day. It describes electrons orbiting the nucleus on paths um, that cannot be determined with a high degree of certainty, okay? Um, but the positions are instead represented by a cloud, and these locations are determined based on uh, probability.
Okay, so it is generally not argued that quantum mechanics gives us the right answers to many questions in physics. Uh, and it has also brought to the light many new concepts. Uh, there is, however, disagreement regarding its significance. Okay? Um, some scientists, including Einstein and Schrodinger, uh, were not satisfied with quantum mechanics and believed it would be replaced uh, with something else that they would be able to, um, once they developed a little bit more sophisticated instrumentation, um, they would be replaced with something a little bit more um, sophisticated or more modern, I guess. And sorry that that cut off there. Okay. Um, so also wanted to talk about Heisenberg, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So this is just saying that if we know the location of an electron really well, um, we do not know the position or the momentum. Um, if we know the momentum, uh, we don't really know the position all that well. Okay, we can only know one or the other. We cannot know both with absolute certainty. Okay, so yeah, this is it for 15.4 uh, and 15.5 and chapter 15, okay? So you guys have a uh, check and reflect. So page 780, 781, here are the questions you are to do. So again, as you complete those, uh, send me a photo, please. Uh, I will post the solutions uh, shortly here, okay? Uh, also... Um, I'm going to assign a chapter 15 take-home quiz, okay, so you guys um, can work on that during Friday's class time or tomorrow's class time, okay, um, so yeah, if you have any questions or you need help with anything, please don't hesitate to ask, and thanks for tuning in, talk to you later.